So thanks everyone for being here. This is our first um, Demythifying Los Angeles event. And it's the first time we're doing one of these online. So bear with us with our YouTube technology. Um, I'm Nicole Yuseto, the programmer for today's event and the co-op member at the EPFC. And for those of you who haven't been to an EPFC event or haven't been to our space, I'm just gonna quickly um, introduce that a bit. And hopefully my Wi-Fi is doing well, All right? So the EPFC is Echo Park Film Center. We're in Echo Park in Los Angeles. We're about 20 co-op members that help run the space, do the day-to-day, -day, just everything there. Um, and we put on programs like this one. And now that we're kind of starting to branch out, so we have a few other locations. So if you're not in Los Angeles, um, you can check out some of these other places and they're all on our website. For example, we have EPFC North at the Mount Moberly Fieldhouse in Vancouver. We now have one popping up in Long Beach. Community Media Arts Center. Um, and this event's actually part of our film mobile, which is kind of separate from our brick and mortar space, um, which does itinerant cinema events. So usually this, if it weren't for COVID, would have happened like in person. Um, we do our summer series where we take our film bus around Los Angeles and we showcase films in the places where they were filmed at or places that you know the films took place in. And it's really great because then you get to see the film like where it's at. So, you know, in this case, our river bottom could have been at the LA River, but alas, COVID, so it was online. But hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do more of these demythifying LA events in person. Just depends how things are going. Um, and so finally, we have EPFC Alvarado, which are, and it's been years. And besides all ASNA, what we do is we provide free film classes for youths and seniors, affordable film workshops for adults. We have an artist in residence program for local artists and an international artist in residence program. And we have micro cinema, which is again in our brick and mortar space. It's a tiny little screen and you can go and watch films there, um, which hopefully we'll be able to reopen sometime soon. But so far it's been closed. We are planning to open the space again in June. So we'll see how it goes from there. If you wanna check us out in person. Um, and finally, we have rentals as well. So if anyone's ever looking for equipment, we have uh, Bolexes, film cameras, and digital cameras, and we digitize film and all sorts of stuff. So finally, this event is Demythifying Los Angeles. It's been a long time in the making. Um, it was supposed to happen last year. COVID pushed it back. And it's with special support from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. So this program, um, I'm gonna introduce Chan and Diego first because this program started at UCLA for me where I was doing a lot of research on films made in Los Angeles, specifically by Latino artists. Um, I'm from LA, I love LA, and I just wanted to see more films that showed the LA that I feel that I, that I know. And um, at UCLA, I started working at the Chicano Studies Research Center and Chana Diego, who's here today, is the director of that center. And he's been there for 19 years, right? And so it was really awesome. It was really helpful. He helped me a lot with the research for these films. Um, I wouldn't have known about River Bottom if it weren't for the CSRC. And a lot of the, the feature films I'm going to show in this series came out of research from there. Um, so it's really great. And so Chana Diego, um, he's a professor at UCLA in the film department, the director of Chicano Studies Research Center. What else? He just got a Guggenheim. It's pretty cool. Uh, he's a curator. Before I met him, I went to go see the home exhibition at LACMA, which is super great. He's been writing a book on um, Rafael Montanez Ortiz, who is someone I work with a lot at the center. So a lot of experimental film in his background, Latino film, art. What am I missing? All sorts of things. I think you got a good amount. <laughs> <laughs> and so Chan and Robert know each other, which is really great. I think it's going to make this Q&A more personable. And so I'm going to introduce Robert and then I'm going to introduce Robert, then I'll hand it over to them. And if anyone has any questions, just please add them in the chat. I'll keep checking it out and um, bringing, bringing them up. Um, but otherwise, we'll let John and Robert kind of like lead in the discussion. So Robert Diaz Leroy, I'm going to read his bio that we have posted, has um, always influenced his Latinx and Native American Tejano O Adam culture into the body and soul of his work. He began on stage as a dancer, singer, and evolved into a performance artist. Next, Robert attended Cal Arts Film School to move his art and storytelling to a higher level. After Cal Arts, D.S. Leroy's script, I'll Be Home for Christmas, won the Hispanic Project Universal Studios Award. 
Later, when he went on to teach at a middle school in an impoverished area for six months, he discovered horrific situations many youths endured. To his shock, some were homeless, but still attending school. These real stories gave him the inspiration for his next film, River Bottom. Since then, D.S. Leroy has made many short films, features, and episodic length projects, including Hub City Heroes, Elvis is Alive, I Swear I Saw Him Eating ding a Ding Dong, and Countdown to Zero. He also works directing commercials, music videos, TV shows, and is currently in post-production for his experimental Latinx horror TV series, Dark Gospels. So Robert and I met like, I don't know, three years ago when I was first thinking about the series and then we never met again. And I messaged him about finally doing this and he was so enthusiastic and it's just so great talking to him each time and he has so much experience in, in film. So I'm really excited to present him, present them both and for the screen for the screenwriting workshop that's gonna happen later. It's gonna be really great. So I'm gonna hand it over to you guys now. And please feel free to add into the chat. I'm gonna keep checking on that. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Robert, great to see you again. And uh, kind of catch up here uh, in terms of uh, film I haven't, I hadn't really seen in probably about 20 years. Uh, I remember first, seeing it right around the time it came out yeah. and being really just blown away because it was very different than any other film I had seen at that time, independent film uh, dealing with uh, Latino characters, uh, but also dealing with the homeless. So uh, as Nicole mentioned, this kind of came about based on your experiences, but I wonder if you can elaborate on those a little bit. Yeah, what was interesting about uh, the creation of River Bottom is that right after I did I'll Be Home for Christmas, I was trying to, what, what do I do next? I mean, what's the next thing? And my brother, uh, who usually does all the music in my films, he said, why don't you come and teach at the school district for a couple months to buy yourself some time and think about what you want to write. And so during that tenure, as I was an RSP teacher at was Martin Luther King Middle School. And it was the worst school in the district in terms of violent crimes. I mean, there's two times during the course of the time I was there, there were dead bodies found on the campus. They ended up closing the school up because it was such uh, in dire straits and physically in the situation. And so my brother brought me in, it was middle school, I was brought in as an RSP teacher, which means I'm a resource specialist. I wasn't in a classroom, so I could go from classroom to classroom and work with students who had a learning issue. And during that time, I started meeting kids that were literally living on the streets. They would come to school during the day, but at night they'd be living like on a park bench. And so I kept on like, I would talk to them, well, why are you even here? I can't even understand, you know, why, what motivates you to come to school? And one girl, she just said, I want to learn. That was her thing. She said, I want to learn. And it was, and Another boy, the, the boxer character, uh, Bobby, and I based that upon a composite of two different people. He was this young boy who was actually trying, he was doing boxing and trying to get into the Golden Gloves. And, but he was living on a park bench also. And his mother was a prostitute. She, he was being used as bartering for drugs. I mean, these kids were in such an extreme situation that I all of a sudden witnessed firsthand as a teacher. I remember I was enraged by the situation. And I go, I'm not a, really a teacher and I'm not a middle school teacher. I don't know what to do here. And so I told my brother, I'm done. I was there for like, I think six and a half, seven months total. And and I said, but I want to, I'm going to, my film, I said, by summer, I want to make this movie about these kids, about this kind of a social commentary about children in, in such an unusual and depressing situation. And in most of the cases, it wasn't going to end up well. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, it's going to be a happy ending. And I don't know if there is a happy ending to this. And so I took that journey. I even stayed, uh, one of my friends who was running homeless shelters, a uh, man who, uh, named Bob Costello, 
he actually arranged for me to go and stay a, uh, in a couple of river bottom encampments. And so I stayed a number of times at some of these river bottom encampments and just watched this world. And it wasn't all of depravity, it was a social, there was a social atmosphere within this environment. And so when I built the movie River Bottom, I wanted it to kind of reflect not only the uh, uh, cross-cultural social commentary, but I also, one of the men that I met was, he used to be a musician. And he always talked about, you know, I, I wish I had my voice back. And he said, and he was referring when he said his voice back was to an instrument. And that's where I, with, with the character Marcus, uh, I used I use actual foundations of reality to embed that into all the characters that are constructed in the movie River Mom. And so, you know, I, I had certain expectations when I made this film. I go, I wanted it to be a legitimate film. I wanted to shoot on 35. I wanted it to have a look. I want, I mean, we had no money. I mean, we did this film for $40,000. And which is nothing. And I had my entire crew and I, you know, I had an incredible group of people, one of them being Al Gomez, Ken Chambers, the actors like Richard Stockton, you know, the person who came in, the two kids that played, these were, they were untrained. Teddy Edwards was an untrained actor, un unbelievable jazz musician, but an untrained actor. So it was taking this mixture of humanity and colliding it together with the support of everyone. Because we had, we shot for around 22 days and no one got paid. Nobody in the, in the cast or crew got paid. You know, and to this day, I, I'm just so indebted to them for allowing us to go on this journey together. And I remember when we took the film to the Flaherty and you invited us to take it to the Flaherty and when they showed it, a person in the audience says, well, do you think a Latino should be making films in 35 millimeter? Do you remember that comment? And I go, what, excuse me? Because you took a contingent of Latinos to that conference. Yeah. And I remember that they were, everyone was just enraged by this comment that someone made. Like, wait, I guess we should just shoot in Super 8 or on video. What, what, we don't have the right to make a 35 millimeter film. And it was, it, it was a solidifying moment at the Flaherty that all of a sudden everybody felt like we're all one group here and the film does represent our ability to make films at any level. So I mean, it's irrelevant what millimeter it is. Mm -hmm. And, and to, you know, again, the one person who helped really fuse the look of it was David Mullen, who now has won two Emmys for Marvelous Miss Maisel. And, I mean, he's a gifted cinematographer, but the two of us knew where we wanted the film visually to go. And I needed someone who had the ability to take it to that level to create that atmosphere that it has. And I believe in the atmosphere today. You know, we're watching it, I go, wow, it's like a visually stunning film as long as well as a social commentary. I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, well, I was, it, it uh, was a yes or no question, but uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I remember that about the, the 35 millimeter. And, and for your part, you kind of flipped it around in another context, pointing out that uh, insofar as the film, it's, it's at once um, a, a fiction. It's a, it's, a, it's a story that you've created, whether it's based on reality or not. But there are also these, uh, what, what I assume to be actual kind of interview segments with people living uh, at the river bottom. Yeah. And you referred to that as perhaps the most uh, e expensive uh, uh, 35 millimeter footage ever shot of homeless people. You know, in, in, in the, yeah, in the context of trying to, to tell their uh, the story. C can you say a little bit about kind of ultimately where the film was able to go? I mean, how you were able to distribute it and... Well, unfortunately, and this is the tragedy of the film, we, we played at literally at film festival after film festival, it went to Cuba, it went to Spain, it, it went all over the world as onto one festival after another. And we had a distribution company that sold it to I think 25, 30 ter territories and she never delivered the prints. And 
which is the tragedy of the film because it, it was funny that there's a whole story that I won't get into, but Fidel Castro saw the film, which was shocking. And he ended up, he made a comment that he goes, he had never seen, he kind of looked at the US differently after seeing the film. Mm-hmm. And here's this person who this adversarial world, you know, clashing cultures, and they opened their doors to me when they screened it, and they gave me access to these incredible things. After at the film festival, he goes, he really likes the film, and he thinks, you know, your your willingness to make a, a commentary about the American culture. It's not a, it's not a good commentary, but. It's willingness to do that, he highly respected and he really enjoyed watching the film. Hmm. That's the Havana Film Festival. And the same thing we everywhere we played it, at film festival at film festival, it was just people were shocked because it marries the two worlds. It has narrative, but it also has these clips of interviews with homeless people, with real homeless people making comments, and I wove the comments into the, the construct of the storytelling. And so mm-hmm. if you watch the film carefully, you'll actually see how they're addressing a moment that's poignant within the story itself. And mm-hmm. yet I felt that it, it's, it fuses in a way, it, the way it works together, it, it's seamless. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's jarring. All of a sudden we're, we're interviewing homeless people. No, it, because it's an observational approach both as a narrative, but also these interviews, we get to have a simultaneous experience as a viewer. Uh, so unfortunately it never got the, uh, a physical release. It did play uh, up in San Francisco. We had a limited theatrical release for three weeks at a couple of different theaters. And that's where um, uh, that was its big thing in the United States, but it really has never been released as a, as a film. Yeah. Did you did you ever get it out on video then? No, it never did. It never was streaming. It's it's um, kind of sitting. It's up to my producer Al Gomez's distress. He goes, "When can we get this film out?" I go, "I don't know." And we're trying to to this day. I'd love to actually get some kind of streaming release. Mm-hmm. It, it's as valid today as it was when we made it. That's what the scary thing is. Well, it's interesting because, you know, at the time, I mean, I, I couldn't really think of any uh, film independent or, um, you know, studio base that was addressing homelessness. You, you have some films dealing with the Great Depression, uh, with orphanages, uh, but living on the streets, uh, you know, or living within a city, with, you know, without a place to sleep. Uh, really, as I recall, didn't seem to have, have been um, done much. And there's been some since then. Uh, but I'm wondering, in terms of taking up this topic and coming at it from a very multiracial uh, perspective, um, you know, what, what the concept, or the guiding concept was, but also uh, your own decisions about what would be appropriate uh, mm-hmm. or effective in conveying this story without moving into the realm that's very easy to move into in, in terms of narrative cinema, which is a more uh, exploitative kind of uh, take, uh, what would end up being, it could end up being called something like poverty porn or something like that, where the audience is deriving some kind of melodramatic pleasure from something that ultimately they will have no relationship to afterwards. Yeah. Uh, well. That it's a vicarious engagement. And, and I say it because, you know, watching the film uh, almost from 30 years, I mean, it's a 28 year old film. The first thing that struck me is stylistically, it's very much of its time. Mm-hmm. And it's very much somewhere in the meeting ground between a certain kind of uh, uh, social independent film and the way that say this would be dealt with more in television movies than in theatrical movies and at the same time so that kind of locates it there's a certain kind of storytelling you're doing that seemed very familiar to me about that time Mm -hmm. 
And then there's the things that I attribute just very directly to you. Um, you know, the use of boxing as a kind of metaphor for what the story is trying to do. Um, the opening and closing with a voiceover that situates it uh, as a, a personal story. Um, although in the body of the film, that's not as present. You're really in a, in a narrative that, uh, that uh, is taking a look at something, right? Oh, absolutely. And then the, the structuring with music, it, it uh, really struck me this time just how much the music is moving uh, the story along, but how the music is also um, external to the film and internal to it at the same time. Uh, it, by way of uh, the Marcus character, yeah, right? Which is essential. I mean, when I first came up with kind of the treatise on how to make this film, I, I set certain boundaries, which everyone says, well, how do you expect you to do that? Because mm -hmm. the very ending scene where Marcus plays kind of his own requiem mm -hmm. or his own death, uh, it's a live performance. It is actually, all of this is live. And, and so people said, well, how are you gonna perform this live in the middle of nowhere? I go, well, tell me the parameters, I'll make it happen and we'll figure it out. And so we shoot it in, in a, it's in the river bottom, but in this kind of large open area that allowed the sound to kind of work for us and not against us and not bounce off of anything. And we shoot it at four o'clock in the morning. And so that whole sequence of him walking up, you think, I mean, it's very complicated. It's dreamlike. It, again, it's, it isn't within its moment in time. You look, I go, that's a very stylistic piece, but it's very 1990s stylistic. And yet there's a magic in it that my brother scored it and wrote those songs. And, and Teddy Edwards, who's this phenomenal jazz musician, Together, they worked on fusing what my brother scores into this live performance. And so it is both external and internal. It works both in a way that pushes certain scenes through, but also it sits back and constantly, we took all this, we had Teddy do all this jazz improv, and we layer that and layer that structurally throughout the film. So we're constantly hearing the saxophone making a comment within the environment of what's happening at different times. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, for having no money, but not taking that as a, a plus or minus, it's just like, okay, what do we have to do to get these things? How do we make this come become a reality? And yeah, making yeah. it and taking advantage, like Teddy, he did this movie for, for a set of golf clubs. That's what he said, well, you know, I need a new set of golf clubs. Can you make that happen? <laughs> I, I think we can do that. Surprised you didn't do more movies with them. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, he was such a delight to work with, but here's this person. We actually, there's a scene when he's talking to the Vietnam vet, you know, Pokey, who's, who moves through the dirt and they are sitting and playing chess. The story Teddy is telling is actually. Teddy Edwards' real story about World War II, about him and Howard McGee. And, you know, they don't end up going into the service. But during that time, you have this, what he explains is the casualties of humanity and how musicians are also these casualties. And so it's his story. I literally say, okay, Teddy, you tell us your story. You to give, give us this insight into your personal moment and where you are and what you think about where you are as a musician. And he articulates in such a concise, poetic way. It's literally his dialogue in that scene. I go, okay, you say what you want to say. Mm -hmm. And it takes it into the personalities. And again, for someone like Teddy Edwards, who's kind of an unsung, unrecognized jazz giant. And this guy was there. He was part of the West Coast jazz you know, he personified, he was the first bebop tenor saxophone player. He started these movements, yet he's not recognized in the United States. He lived in this little tiny apartment above a garage. He'd go play in Europe, 
all the time. We'd come back to live in this little garage. And when we first met him, it was like, you're a legend, but unrecognized within our own world. And so I tried to em embrace that true sense of who he was within the structure of the story. And, you know, the flexibility of being the writer director, I could take it anywhere I wanted to. Yeah. That's, I, again, we were using the music both internally and externally to, to drive narrative at the same time, make us feel an emotion in the moment was, was part of what made the film to me magical. So I'm, I'm wondering how much did Cal Arts play in terms of your, the approach you would ultimately take as a filmmaker over the last three decades? Because I've always been intrigued by the fact that, and I always attribute it to you more in terms of your personality, that you're, you're very concept driven in your approach to film. But I don't mean that in a way that um, would typically be thought of in terms of the concepts existing only within the aesthetic. You seem to be driven as much by conceptualizing approaches to impossible situations as you do to the conundrum of how do you tell certain kinds of stories that have either been told wrong or that haven't been told at all. And I'm just wondering how much of this comes out of the Cal Arts environment that you were part of in the late 80s, early 90s, because it's, it's kind of fascinating to see that as a source for your body of work. You know? Oh, I, I think... It's a hundred percent part of my personality. I mean, <laughs> Cal Arts, uh, when I decided to go to film school, it was like a decision. You know, I was offered a variety of schools, all accepted me. Mm -hmm. The school that would allow me to be me was Cal Arts, and so they go, "Well, you come from a performance background. You can take acting. You can do." It. They let me take every class I wanted. I, mm -hmm. I much in their acting program as I was in, is in the film program. I can do anything that I wanted to within that time. And, and so it complemented, and I think what CalArts does, it's an art school. Yeah. Art school. Well, and they're making, they're making artists as much as they're making specialists, right? Um, and, I, and I think that's what I find really fascinating is that you, you really are taking a holistic approach to the arts, but you're making a film the end of the day. But even what you were just describing about Teddy Edwards, um, th there are ways in which you're weaving in um, the, the, the kind of parallel stories of the artist making the film, as well as the subject of the film, which uh, are, you know, is inspired by a group of students that you were teaching. Well, and how to bring those together in the process of making it is a very different kind of, of approach. Um, I think you're right in saying holistic. I mean, uh, even taking David Mullen, when I did my first, I graduated a year early because I won this writing competition and I'm still at Cal Arts. And they kind of like, well, you're still in school, but you're going to go do this film at Universal Studios. That's cool. I mean, Ed Entschweller, who is the dean of the film school at the time, he goes, wow, this is what it's all about. He goes, I, I had done a boxing film when I was in Cal Arts. I literally, created a boxing event where almost all the student bodies showed up. And I put on a real boxing match where I fight like a real boxer in this ring. And, and he goes, you're so visceral. <laughs> he goes, you're like this bulldog that doesn't stop. But he goes, you conceptualize it, but you take it and you, and you do it, you make it happen. And when I said, well, I will, uh, and when I asked Ka David Mullen to shoot I'll be home for Christmas. David Mullen goes, I've never shot a 35 millimeter film. I go, what does it matter? I go, it's just all the same thing. So it's taking someone like David Mullen, who's incredibly gifted, just a gifted DP. But even being, a, he's at Kyle Arts. It's his kind of thing. He, he, is, he understands the, the full dynamics of, of filmmaking. He really does. He's an encyclopedia of film knowledge. And I think that, that that environment really raises the standards for every single student. If you want to perform, you can take it easy or you can go for broke. And I always like to say, well, what's the worst thing they can do? Kill me? I mean, really, what's, you know, and that's, that they can't. I mean, if they do, then they do. But 
what I, I think that film is about, what makes film so incredible for me is that you can commit 100% to something and make it come both as a piece of art, art, you can tell a narrative, you can push the envelope of how you tell the narrative, and you can push the envelope of what is narrative. Because it's, there's no structure except anti-structure. We impose structure on things, but that's only because we think we, think we have to follow a narrative linear line. That's, that's an arbitrary you know, fiction. It's a, it's a nonfiction. I mean, it's not true. It's not true. Now, it seems early on in your career with River Bottom and uh, the project you were working on uh, just after that, you really were physically committed. There was an element of, of uh, the kind of embodiment of directing by bringing in the kind of performance element. Um, the opening uh, shots of boxing in River Bottom, that's actually you there. And you, you know, you kind of shared with us that you broke a few ribs. And when we went to Flaherty, I can't remember if you showed some footage of the dirt bike film. Oh. I remember seeing uh, some shots and it was you on the dirt bike and that that project went down when you went down and, and broke every joint in your arms, right? Yeah, I like, I mean, I, I find um, that filmmaking for me is an immersive experience that at times I know where I want something to go. And so instead of having instead of having interpreted just by an actor if i know i can play a certain role and be part of it then why don't i just play the role and know where i want to take it that moment and so i did i uh we were, it was downhill break and when we were in pre-production we we're shooting all these shots and i ended up crashing horribly and end up in upper body traction and couldn't feed myself or go to the bathroom and thanks to my wonderful mother she said you can come and stay with us and i'll feed you and i'll make sure you can go to the bathroom and and it's a humbling she, she must have thought that that job was done but uh yeah. you kind of <laughs> and before that she was done with it yeah was it, that was done with this 20 some years ago or 30 years ago <laughs> but what i but have you have you changed though uh, it seems like you're not um putting your body on the line at this point uh forward but uh, I, uh well, well yes and no um the project that we are in post on this series dark gospels actually it's a very hard high concept film it's a horror film but again it's dealing with a cross-cultural issue it actually takes the idea of it takes an exorcism and puts it in a room and it's in two languages and so the family, the, and I have a priest who cast the, one of the people that plays a priest is from Spain. The, the, the parents are both from Mexico and, and the girl, all of it. So we had this clash of English and Spanish within the structure of it. And it's a story about, it takes the idea of the supernatural and possession. And I try to move it into a cross-cultural world that, that addresses the idea of how does every culture deal with the supernatural. How do we look at it differently? Uh, uh, I've had some people that non Latinos look at the property and they get they don't get it. They go, but why are they acting that way? I go, well, because it's the culture. This is part of the culture. This is why it's built this way. And so they can't wrap their head. And so it's filmed. I did this film. It's a series. It's a six hour long series, but we did it all in one take. The entire series was done in one take. And so the actors had to be able to perform nonstop, uninterrupted, doing everything that they had to do uh, with, I say, action at the beginning, and there's cut at the end. That's it, one more, and they have to go through the whole thing. And I end up playing uh, a priest that comes in the last hour, and the priest, he's, he's a heroin addict, he's, he's like, has all these issues with him but when he walks into the room he's still an exorcist so is, is, is this series uh, scripted or is it outlined it's both it's outlined and tightly scripted certain things have to be said to move it forward it has to hit the right moments then it's outlined because it has to move literally through hours of material 
And so people, and I had, we went through 3,000 people in casting. And it was, we had to have people that could have incredible performance ability to improv, but at the same time, know their dialogue that had to be said when and where it has to be done. And so it was, it's a phenomenal, and we're in post and it's scary, but it's also, it's very scary. And when you watch it, you what, what post is there to do if you're not, if you don't have a single cut? <laughs> Five cameras and you actually how it works together. It takes you. It's. It seems like you're watching something that you shouldn't be watching. Is this one camera? No, it's five cameras. Okay. Okay. So oh, you are editing. No. Yes and no. I mean, it's actually five cameras in. Three of them are in locked position, so you're watching it unedited at times. But then it makes these radical jumps in time to move because we shot for ten hours straight. So I'm trimming four hours out of it, but it's done through these interesting devices of storytelling. And it's it's a hybrid of, of storytelling. It, it, it makes actors and all the actors that came away from it said, oh my God, what I will never have an experience like this again. It's like, it's pushing an actor to their limits. And then one, one man who plays the father of the girl, he goes, I came out of there as if I felt like I ran three marathons in a row. I've never, in my life, ever had an experience like that because it was so alive. Every emotion you're feeling. Yeah. Now, it seems like there's it, there's at least two ways to make something like this really happen, and one is the Marina Abramovich approach, which is, you know, everybody puts a trucker flask on and just guts it out for <laughs> ten hours, uh, or uh, you, as the director and the screenwriter. Um, are basically writing and shooting with a sense of how uh, people refresh, change uh, clothes, go to the bathroom, have have a uh, catering, um, you know, get the peek at the script again. Are you doing that in the? Did you do that in the kind of planning of the production, or was it just here we go? And no, I explained. We went with our rehearsals were structural storytelling rehearsals where everybody had to know what they had to be and certain people knew certain things about other people that other people wouldn't know mm. so with vice of it the one person that really controls the environment in the room is the girl that's possessed she both plays the girl that's possessed and the demonic presence so she has the hardest role in performance having to dip into the background of each person so they all have their backstories, they all know their narrative lines, but then she'll say something that tugs at a narrative line that only they know, no one else in the room knows. So everyone's responding to it like the person, how the hell do you know about that, about me? And she digs into them. At the same time, my one of my actors has a headset with an earpiece in it. And so I'm also live directing, say, oh, we got to pick up here, this, this, this. And so he had to, both, he, it's the only moving camera. So he has to do certain things simultaneously as he's getting information fed by me. And so I'm watching all these screens in a separate room. We had to build a set where everything had to be fully controlled. So all the effects like snakes coming out of drawers or doors flying open, those are all real. They don't know when they're gonna happen, but all these things happen. Uh, neighbors getting murdered next door, doors all locking themselves while they're in there the bed lifting up they none of them knew these things would happen but it was all designed into the set and when my crew so i'm saying you can do this 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 so i'm puppeteering as the live performance moves on and they're responding in real time so it was very complicated uh but it was kind of a massive achievement because it it takes you into a space that you're watching the story unfold that you feel like I'm watching something real and they're responding to it in a real way. Mm -hmm. Even though they're following their own narrative through line and knowing what words they do have to say when they have to say that. So it's, it was, yeah. we had to gut it out because once I said action, it was like, didn't stop. And <laughs> after the first 45 minutes, they go, oh my God, he's not going to yell cut. Yeah. And they, so they all started, you know, slugging through it. And for them, they said they wouldn't leave like we shot 10 hours we finish at 11 o'clock at night they didn't leave for another three hours they were so enthused about the process they go i've never in my life 
These are very well trained actors. Yeah. So I can't imagine ever having this experience ever again, yeah. ever in my life. Well, it, it's more like epic theater than it is a film production. Absolutely. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how that, what kind of film that that produces. So I'm really looking forward to that. I know we're getting close to the time you're going to have a workshop in a little bit, but I want to ask you the kind of eternal question for uh, filmmakers. There's this kind of saying that uh, no matter how many films a filmmaker makes, they're really just making the same film over and over again, um, which is to say they're trying to answer a question. And you've really had a very wide range of, of films. There's a certain set of genres you kind of work in, but then you have things like Elvis is Alive. I swear I saw him eating ding-dongs outside the Piggly Wiggly. Uh, and I remember Piggly Wigglies, you know. Yeah. Um, a Fred Willard vehicle. Um, so it, it, he's as much the genre as uh, anything. But, but there's also a way in which you seem to have certain fascinations, not just the aesthetic ones, not just the, uh, the, the kind of conceptual challenges. And I wonder how you would describe that. What's the tagline for the, the question you've been trying to answer for the last 30 years? Oh my God, great question. I, I think the tagline, I, I'm in search of, I'm always searching for an elusive truth. That's really, I mean, it's elusive and I know it. So every time I make a film, I'm, I'm writing a series for a company right now. And it's an 18 episode drama series that I'm, I was hired by this wonderful company. And the producer, he just said, well, you, you take so much and you build because all they handed me was an eight page treatment. And I'm making an 18 episode series, writing up 18 episode series. Because how do you go, where are you going all the time? And it is elusive. I mean, uh, James Elroy wrote a really great book called My Dark Places. And it's really about how do you find what you're searching for in the story? And I think we all have to admit that, yeah, we're telling the same story over and over again. It's a journey. I mean, it's, it's, it's the Iliad. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the hero's journey. I'm not the hero, but it's the hero's journey. And what I search for is the elusive question of truth for whatever given question is being asked. Okay, can I bring something that is honest about this? Like my exorcism piece, it's not an exploitive exorcism piece. There's no spinning heads, but it's scary because it goes to the depth of who we are and what we're responsible for. And that was the question for me. It's like, mm -hmm. what is the elusive truth? It's yeah. always asking why? Why do we do what we do? Yeah. Well, that's, I think, a very accurate uh, description because I would say most films propose an answer. That's how they end. And with River Bottom, I think what really kind of jolted me uh, watching it again is that your the story is ultimately put forth as the story of survival for the sister, not mm -hmm. for the brother. For the brother. But what we're really left with is, uh, you know, loss and uh, death in the film. So it's not a triumphal story. It's not telling you how she survived necessarily. It's just the mere fact of that. So I, I, I think that's a really good description you've given. You, you are um, searching for an answer you can't provide ultimately and you leave us with that ambiguity. And I think that uh, makes for a very powerful uh, body of uh, work. Um, it, I'll even throw in Elvis is Alive there too, so, <laughs> which I really liked. <laughs> well, the ending of Elvis, we miss interviewing him by 30 seconds. He's going <laughs> like, we're sure. We have Dr. Joyce Brothers and you've got all sorts of people in there. <laughs> uh, Wayne Newton, for God's sake. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so, well, thank you, Robert. This has been uh, really wonderful kind of catching up again and uh, wow. going over some uh, old territory, but also hearing about the new work. And uh, well, really and congratulations on the Guggenheim. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Well, we'll turn it back over to uh, Nicole to take us out here, right? Great. Thank you guys so much both for um, having that discussion. I think that was a really good place to leave it at too. So everyone who's tuning in in the class, we will see you soon. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And this will be recorded and on YouTube. You want to watch it every day again? <laughs> I think that's it. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank you.